It's good to be home. There hadn't been many days over the last six years since I left that I didn't think about coming back to Cleveland. We had uh, security personnel at the time who were former snipers, and they taught me something about flags, and they said if you look at the angle that a flag is blowing, and you divide by four, that's the approximate wind speed. Cleveland fans see the Browns as an extension of themselves. This is their city, this is their identity. Welcome inside Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. I'm Jay Crawford. Thrilled to be joined this week by the man who's kicked more field goals in Cleveland Browns history than any other kicker, Phil Dawson. Phil, great to see you. Yes, sir. Good to be here. Newly retired. Has yes. it sunk in yet? No, it has not. Uh, you go from being a player to making a little announcement, and then you're a former player just like that. It's good to be home. Uh, there hadn't been many days over the last six years since I left that I didn't think about coming back to Cleveland. And to have the opportunity to do it today is not only special for me, but my entire family as well. The connection that I had and still have to the city of Cleveland is my most cherished accomplishment of my career. There's no greater sports town in America than Cleveland. There are no greater fans in football anywhere. And like I said when I was here, and I now still believe it to be true, there will be no greater place on the planet to be when the Lombardi Trophy goes down Euclid Avenue. And you can bet your last dollar I will be there to celebrate with everyone. So I'm sure you've thought about what's next. And before we get to specifically what's next, what, what are you most looking forward to? My favorite time of year is the fall and early winter. And all these years in football, it's prevented me from doing the things I really want to do, such as watching my boys play. Mm -hmm. So I'll get that opportunity. Uh, being around the house for the holidays. I've, I've joked with my family for years, my first Christmas at home, I'm going to be Clark Griswold. <laughs> I'm going to be on the roof putting up lights and we're going to have way too many decorations in the yard. I mean, because I love Christmas. And when you're playing and going to work, it's hard to get get in the mood. And then the other hobby of mine is deer hunting. So I'm going to have an opportunity to get out in the country and, and uh, experience that. And so uh, it, it's going to be a fun fall. What do you think you'll miss the most? You know, I think the sense of accomplishment uh, that you get knowing you did your job. Uh, I, I played such a misunderstood position, you know, people just see a guy go out there and put a ball through two posts and they think that's all there is to it and there's all the running jokes, it must be easy, you never work, you know, you have a lot of free time, blah, 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 but so much effort and time and energy goes into so few opportunities. I mean, it literally all boils down to 25, 30 times you go on the field in a year. So to, for, for a moment to be that intense and to know that you came through and all that work proved beneficial. Uh, I always enjoy just looking out the window on an airplane on the way home going, wow, no one else is gonna think all too much about that 36 yarder, but I know what I was feeling and to be able to make it and the accomplished sense of accomplishment that comes yeah. with that. What will you miss the least? Preseason games. <laughs> They're a par putt. So when you make a par putt, you're supposed to. Yeah. You don't really feel good walking off the green. Uh, but if you miss a par putt, now you feel terrible. Well, that's how preseason kicks are. You make them all, well, you're supposed to, there's really no upside. But if you miss one, now people start questioning, or you <laughs> see the same guy, the team starts kind of getting uncomfortable. So I just, I'd rather just get right to week one and go from there. You had such a long career, played with so many different guys. As you look back on your former teammates, do you have some favorite teammates that immediately come to mind, and who are they? Well, I do. Chris Gardaki, first of all, was, yeah. was my mentor. He, he was well-established in this league. I was just a young pup trying to learn the ropes, and he was one of those guys that would teach you something without you realizing it. And looking back, I really appreciate that about him. I was so comfortable with him, and he got me going. Dave Zastadil, a hometown hero and very dear friend of mine, uh, obviously my holder, but even better than that, great friend. Ryan Pontbriand, I was fortunate to have a snapper for almost a decade, three-time Pro Bowler. I mean, when you have guys like Chris and Dave and Pont in your battery, 
yeah. makes kicking the ball pretty easy. And then, you know, I always kind of rub shoulders with the quarterbacks a little bit. Uh, they were usually golfers. I like to golf, so mm -hmm. we'd hang out. But, you know, starting Doug Peterson way back in the day, wow. he, he came through here for a cameo and we became close friends. Trent Dilfer, unbelievable guy, unbelievable family. Uh, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Colt McCoy, obviously a Longhorn. We shared that bond. So the the hard thing about a list is you don't know where to cut it off. Yeah, exactly. I've been fortunate to have so many good ones. What's some of your favorite stories, um, particularly here to Cleveland? You know, I, I still remember that first uh, first game where Drew Carey came out <laughs> and introduced the Browns. I was already out because I had to get ready for the kickoff. And we were all new here. None of us, I mean, we knew about the Browns, but we were all imports. So how could we possibly understand the intensity of the history, the, the loyal fan base, and how much that's a tangible thing you can feel in the stadium. So we're all just kind of hanging out, trying to do this thing. And Drew Carey comes out, and you know I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Thank you! I want to send a message! A message to everyone who ever made fun of Cleveland! A message to anyone who ever told a Cleveland joke or laughed at a Cleveland joke! You can now officially shut up! We're here to play football, baby! And if you came here to get mellow, you can turn around and get out! Cause Cleveland rocks, am I right? Cleveland rocks! Cleveland rocks! Cleveland rocks! Cleveland rocks! Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the 1999 Cleveland Browns! You know, here come the 1999 Cleveland Browns, and that roar from that stadium at that moment in time, I will put up against any roar I've heard in any stadium since. Wow. This city was so happy to have their Browns back after everything they had gone through. It was just an incredible moment. And that's when I knew, okay, this is a special place. I need to try to hang around here. And you had an appreciation for that, coming from Texas, playing for the Longhorns. You know that there it's not just a hobby, a casual way to spend your Saturdays. It, it is a way of life. Were there similarities, did you think, between the fan bases of, of Texas and the Cleveland Browns? It, it, yes, in that they love their team. There, there's, there's no doubt about it. But nothing rivals Cleveland. It just, it's a different deal. And, and I thought I knew this in my time here, but then I had a chance to go play for the 49ers, which was an incredible experience. First class organization. They call their fans the faithful, and they were great. And then I went to Arizona, and boy, sellout after sellout mm -hmm. after sellout, and it's loud, and, and it's great there. But the passion and the connection between player and fan here is unmatched anywhere. So it's a lot more than just the volume coming out of the stands. It's the, it's the connection that the players have with the fan base and nothing rivals that. Does it, does it seem like it's been 20 years? No, uh, my first uh, coach here, Chris Palmer, when it came final cut day, I was competing for the job. He said, we're gonna start out with you. And I took that as a, I have one bad game I'm gone. And so I literally put my head down and I just went to work and I tried to survive. And I don't know that I ever changed that mentality, mm. even all these years later. So I was so busy, focused on what was required to be ready for the next kick. I had no time to consider how long I've been doing this. So here I am, tw two decades later, a former player, and I, it feels like yesterday I was just starting. Have you figured out what it is about the average Clevelander that, that makes them be so passionate about this organization? I certainly don't think I have it all figured out, but Cleveland fans see the Browns as an extension of themselves. This is their city. This is their respect for where they came from. This is their identity. And a lot of other places, you go and you cheer for a group of individuals who wear your uniform. But here, this is the... This is Cleveland. I mean, this is Cleveland. And so when someone travels around and tells someone where they're from, I heard it a million times. A lot of people would say, I'm a Browns fan. 
before they'd even say I'm from Cleveland because it's all the same. Right. Yeah. Just theorizing here, do you think that they took to you the way they did because you saw that so early and had a great appreciation for, for that passion? I hope what they saw was one of them, a guy who had a job to do, and no matter if it was adversity in his face or things hadn't been going his way, whatever the case may be, he got up in the morning, he went to work, he worked as hard as he could, he went home, spent time with his family, and he got up and did it the next day. And I feel like that's Cleveland. People around here get up every morning, go work hard, come home, enjoy their families, and regardless of the outcomes of their efforts, they're going to get up and do the same dang thing the next morning. The winning wasn't always there, but you had a lot of good memories, and we'll get to some of those in a bit. But I'm wondering if any off-field memories come to mind for you. Some of your favorite experiences, Cleveland, not with the helmet on and the pads, but just being a Clevelander. I can remember in those later years of my career here, uh, almost not being able to go anywhere without being recognized. And the people were incredible. It wasn't one of those stories you hear all the time about getting hassled or any of that. It, the, I'd walk through Crocker Park at Christmas time, Christmas lights up, go get a picture with Santa Claus or Frosty the Snowman. And the Browns fans would, you know, take my family in, hey, come sit over here by us in this restaurant. Or, hey, they'd ask me a question here. Just, it was such a special time for not only me and my family, it seemed like everywhere I went, it was just a reminder of how incredible this place is. I know Austin is still home, mm -hmm. but Cleveland's your second home. Right? It is, it is. What areas might we likely see you in as, as a post football player? Well, I've promised my wife that I will at least explore avenues outside of football. Mm -hmm. Having said that. <laughs> <laughs> it is I, what you know. It is what I know. It's where my expertise is. It's where my relationships are. I still have a love for the game uh, that I've always had. Uh, so I wouldn't be all that surprised if it's not in football somehow. Now you say you've promised your wife, you almost say that as if you're well aware that she wants it to be anything but football. No, is that the case? I think she's just wanting to challenge me to uh, broaden my horizons a little mm. bit. Uh, I think she would be fully supportive if I decided to go that route. Uh, but man, football has been so good to me and I think in the future it's going to be my opportunity to give back through it. Yeah. You have two boys that play. I do. Did you raise them to be kickers? Not at all. Not at all. Did you specifically steer them away from kicking? No, but I never encouraged it. Yeah. You know, I always said, hey, if you, want to, if you want to do it, I'll try to teach you. And yeah. fortunately for me, neither one of them ever came to me and said <laughs> they want to do it. So we dodged the bullet on that one. I'm sure knowing everything you know about it, the pressures involved, yeah. you're probably relieved that they didn't want to do that. Um, yes, and you know it's a new experience for me now, sitting in the stands watching them. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife's the veteran; she's used to being able to do that. Well, now I find myself sitting there, and I am so uptight. It's helpless, and, isn't oh, it? It's awful. Yeah. Right? I don't know how she's done it all these years, and uh, so I I can't even imagine how much worse it would be if they were kickers. Trot it on the field, down two with three game seconds winner. to go to kick a game winner. I've always wondered, and I love talking to kickers about this, about the mindset, because I think more than any other position in sports, perhaps, it is a mindset position. Did you have to train your mind to push the situation and the potential result out of the factor and the equation for you, or were you just wired that way? A little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, from my earliest memories of playing sports, I always loved the big moment. Mm. I just did. Uh, and we could be talking Little League Baseball. I love two outs, 0-2 oh mm. count, game on, you know, I just, I loved it. Yeah. That almost got magnified when I became a kicker because I went from playing all the time, being on the field with a lot of opportunities to influence the game to now five or six. And so when it came down to one of those critical situations, now newsflash, they're all critical. But the ones that everyone would say are critical, I felt like this was my chance to have an impact on the game, and that excited me. Yeah, uh, The whole mental, I found that the way you 
train the mental is train the physical. I, I've got so many reps in my muscle memory of good, what I wanted to come out when I was under pressure. I kicked a ton. I was told my whole career, you kick too much, you kick too much, you're going to wear your leg out. I was conditioned to do that because I knew I wanted all that in my muscle memory so that when I came out here, I could be a wreck mentally. Yeah. I just put it on autopilot and here and it came. The so the, these guys that try to train their minds, maybe it works. I could never control my mind, but I sure as heck could control my preparation. And I think that's what got me through. Let's go back to your early days. Oh, um, how did you fall into football? And ultimately, how did you end up as a kicker? So my dad was a college football player. Mm -hmm. He was a quarterback at Baylor. And I grew up around the game. My granddad had been a high school football coach. So all I ever wanted to do, you know, like most little boys, I wanted to do what dad did. Yeah. And uh, my dad wouldn't let me play until middle school. Really? So Is there I had, a reason for that? That was just his policy. Yeah. And I wasn't allowed to ask why. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just how it was. And so I played every sport known to man up to that point. And then when it came time to go to seventh grade, I got to go out for my first football team. I played offense, I played defense. I had some buddies who had been on my soccer teams growing up. I just kind of did that because it was soccer season. It wasn't, I was never a true soccer player, but mm -hmm. they had seen me kick a ball and we needed a kicker on the football team. So the coach said, can anybody kick? And all my buddies said, Phil can. And that's literally how it started. But I continued to play other positions all through high school. And then when college came around, that was when I had the opportunity to go to the University of Texas only to be a kicker. And so I reluctantly made the decision that I was gonna be a kicker at that point because University of Texas was where I had always wanted to go. Yeah, what were your other sports and if not football, what would have it been for you? Probably baseball. Yeah. I was a lefty, played first base, pitched a little bit. Nice. Could hit the ball every now and then. Uh, <laughs> but I played, I mean, I played basketball, uh, played soccer, swim team, golf, uh, you name it. I mean, I was just, whatever season it was, that's what I was playing. Yeah. And uh, those were the good old days, man. It seems like these days kids specialize at such a young age. You know, back, back when we were growing up, you just, yeah. Whatever season you did it, it was, all. you just rolled out there and did it. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So you finish Texas with a BA in political science. Yes. And as you know, when you're coming into the league, that's such a make or break time. And I'm sure there are guys that certainly had talent to stick in the league and have long careers, but they didn't stick that first time and it never happened. Right. Had it not happened for you, what would Phil Dawson be doing today? And that's a great question. Uh, when I got cut in Oakland, my first training camp, they messed the paperwork up so that 24-hour waiver period went, came and went, and no one picked me up, so I thought. So I went from Oakland to Dallas and literally had about 12 hours of, what do I do now? Well, come to find out, the paperwork was just late, and I got picked up on, on, on waivers from New England, so I didn't have to right. go very far down that road. But I've always, you know, I got my education, I graduated from the University of Texas, but I was all in on football. Yeah. And every ounce of my attention and focus was gonna be on that. And literally, today's the first day, now that I'm retired, to wake up and say, my 100% focus and attention is not on being the best football player I can be. So I'm literally 44 years old, and I'm now gonna figure out what's next. It's fun though. Yeah, it's exciting. When you were waived by the Raiders and then ultimately picked up by the Patriots. It was interesting because they kept you and put you on the practice squad. That's something that you don't see a whole lot of. And that was back when it was only five players. Yeah. So what was that conversation like? So uh, Adam, this was before Adam was Adam. Right. He was still an unbelievable player, mm -hmm. but he hadn't made the big kicks everyone remembers now. Uh, he had a growing injury all preseason. I think initially they were concerned that that may, might flare up at any moment. So they needed someone in the bullpen to be ready to go. And wow. I think that's how this whole thing started. It then turned into Adams in his contract year and we're not sure he's gonna come back to New England. So we're gonna just groom you, give you a year under your belt to learn from a guy like Adam, and then we'll make a seamless transition 
uh, once that season's over. And an interesting tidbit to that, so that's the 98 season. The Browns are coming back in 99. Give you one guess who the Browns wanted in free agency as their kicker. Adam. Adam Vinatieri. Adam is on a plane to Cleveland to sign the contract. I'm talking to Bobby Greer, or my agent is talking to Bobby Greer, the GM of the New England Patriots. We're working out a deal for New England. I don't know if Adam changed his mind. He'd have to tell you the details. But at some point, somewhere along the way, Adam changed his mind, stayed in New England. That's why I came to Cleveland. Serendipity. Yep. When you think back to your playing days here in Cleveland, favorite moment on the football field? And that's, that's a hard one. One that comes to mind is, and I can't even remember what year it was, but William Green broke a long run down this sideline right here. Jimmy Donovan was run, William, run. On second down, they give it to Green. Green, stutter step, he's through. First down, 40, 45, 50, 45, 40. Run, William, run. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown. <laughs> We've been waiting for it to break the big one, but he saved it for the right time. 64 yards, and the rookie from Boston College, he was an inch away from busting one all day, Doug, and he just did it. It was late in the year. We needed to win this game to keep our playoff hopes alive, and this crowd, it reminded me of that Drew Perry crowd. Really? When he called the team up. It was like, oh my gosh, my team is back and we're actually going to win this game that we needed to win. Because let's be honest, there's a little bit of that fear in the Cleveland mentality. We're going to get right to that moment, and then the rug's going to get yanked out from under us. And I think there was a little bit of that going on in that game that day. And for us to get over that and win that game, and I think that was the year we wound up making the playoffs, yeah. was, was it just... I think the moments I enjoyed, the kicks I remember, are probably not the ones other people would would mention but there's always just those little tidbits along the way what kick are you most asked about uh probably the uh, baltimore kick that bounced everywhere and then the close <laughs> second is the uh, blizzard bowl yeah the long one there that hit the same stanchion kind of interesting that it happened in the same season i'd like you to walk us through that down on the field. Are you, are you good with doing that? Sure. Snap is back. They place it down. Dawson's kick is a line drive and it is off the, oh. off the crossbar and good! <laughs> he did it again! It's crazy being out here, you know, being back with you and yeah. it seems like it's been, you know, many years even though Hasn't been too long, but it's funny when we stand here, standing at that goalpost, I still remember that, that 2008 game versus Buffalo. Uh, a little colder that day. The thing about that game, people never, people failed to realize was not only, obviously the snow was everywhere, it was a blizzard, but it was the crosswind yes. of almost 30, 35 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and it I was literally picking snow up off the ground and blowing it. So it wasn't even the snow coming down, it was... Yeah. Coming up. And okay. Romeo called timeouts, I think, only twice that game for us to move and clear it out, one for a punt, uh, and obviously that, that great kick. Yeah. Um, but I still remember coming out, you know, and, and uh, clearing off the ground and looking up, and I see this, you know, huge swell of wind coming across, and we're 49 yards out, into probably the hardest wind I've ever seen. And you looked at me and you said, hey, I'm going about 10 yards outside left. To me, yeah, right you're there. like, hey, Dave, I'm going way out there. And, and I literally sat there and I said, there's no physical way, not only Phil, anybody can make this kick. Yeah. And that yeah. ball went like this and it went yep. right through it. And it hit the bar. Yeah. It hit the bar. And it didn't get much higher than the crossbar the whole way. Oh, I mean, yeah. it was just a missile. Yeah. Uh, I, I think if Buffalo had actually put their hands up, it would have been blocked. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason, they didn't. Might have just gone around them. And didn't I say something when I was lining up? I said, there's no chance. Yeah, no chance. Yeah. Yeah, but no you know what? I think. What made you great is all the hard kicks from the distance is you were able to kind of just say, hey, there's no pressure on me because no one expects me to make it. And when you made it, uh, you know, that's a memory that, you know, still sits with me today. Well, and I think that was a game 
the stadium came alive, right? Since yeah. the Browns had come back, they were waiting for the team to be good and for it to be a late in the year kind of game, lot on the line, bad weather, tough back and forth game. And I, yeah. I, man, I can just remember hearing this place. I mean, yeah. it was. Yeah, I still remember incredible. you turning and going like this. Yeah, I think I threw my shoulder out. And I, I was, was trying to catch you, and, and I couldn't <laughs> find you. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a really good memory. Uh, yeah. But it, it it's almost kind of similar to the one in Baltimore when you had, you know, the that that game winner where it hit the bar, the crossbar, the back bar came back over. Yeah. This is it, second week in a row for the tie. End over end, end over end. It is up and it is. Oh, it hit the crossbar and hit the upright and it's no good. Oh, it hit it and bounced back into the field of play. And it looks like the Browns have lost it. The officials are huddling in the end zone, but the teams are heading into the locker room. After discussion on the field, the field goal hit the top of the crossbar, went over and hit the extension on the backside, which in fact is a good field goal. It bounced back. The field goal was good. And I remember you going like this. And you, you, you felt like you let the team down, even though it was a really, really tough kick. And Matt Stover came out, remember? Yeah, that's right. The whole team left the field. Everybody thought it was over. Uh, back then, the refs weren't allowed to review. But fortunately for us, they did. And yeah. so they went back and they saw that the ball had hit the stanchion. And so they called the teams back out, said field goal's good. And then we went to overtime and won it in overtime. So that's where the, the rule named after me came into effect. So I've made my contribution <laughs> to the game. And then you hit the game winner overtime. In my basement, I don't have a lot of things hung up anymore, but I have the one from USA I Today. I love that picture. Where Ed Reed's looking up like this. And kind of ironic, he's in Canton now at the Hall yeah. of Fame. And I'm chasing after you. And yeah. that was I had another... a bad habit of kind of running off. I, yeah. I hate that about myself because you did the hard work there. <laughs> and I should appreciate what you did. But for whatever reason, I get fired up. And there I go. Yeah. You caught up pretty quick. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think I caught you on the Monday night game in Buffalo that year. Zastadil puts his knee down at the 47. Takes the snap, puts it down, Dawson into the ball. Hand over end, hand over end. It is up, it's good! Oh. <laughs> and that was another 58 yarder you made at, and, you know, at, at the end of the game or um, you know, into the third quarter, I can't remember now. But that was a 50 yarder with another crosswind of yeah. you know, probably 25 miles an hour. And I caught you, I think I hugged yeah. you that yeah. time. Well, you uh, remember we get so much practice in the wind, we should be pretty good at it. Yeah. It's, yeah. the, it's the guys that don't practice in it, then they come here and it, this place freaks them out. Yeah. So the, the best story, one of the best stories was we're coming out of the tunnel and Chris Brown and it was one year, one year was Chris Brown, the other one was um, the guy from uh, Indianapolis, the kicker uh, at the time. I don't know if it was Vanderjack Jack maybe. Jack. And he's doing warm ups and all and he comes up to you and he just goes, Phil, I just got a question. How do you do this here? <laughs> I and, I, no and I think that's one thing that I think the history books may never catch up with you. Um, I hope they do, is just how difficult it was to kick here. It really was. Uh, never knew, it, no two Sundays were the same. No. And No two know, halves. No, I mean, it was it's always changing, field always changing. We'd have games in the first half, it was warm, second half it was cold. I mean, it was just constantly a challenge. So yeah. I think that's one of the things I enjoyed, though, is it never got old. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was able to go play again and play in a dome for two years in Arizona. Great place, beautiful place, but it almost got a little boring because you I didn't even have to go out and check anything before the game. Yeah, and no. you know playing there. Yeah, we missed each other by two yeah. years. So, But it was perfect field, no wind every week. Yeah. Well, here, you didn't know what was going on, so it always kept you on your toes. Yeah, and I think what helped too is AFC North. You had Baltimore, Pittsburgh, you had Cincinnati. Kicker we never, We never had it, had it easy. Nope. Um, and then preseason, we're playing the rest yes. of the uh, Great Chicago Lakes Chicago and Green yeah. Bay. Yeah. yeah, it just wouldn't, you know, we might get one or two games a year that benign conditions. Other than that, it was hold on to your hats, here we go. And I think you and I would always get the schedule together, preseason, go, all right, November, December, do we have any away in domes? And it'd be Buffalo, <laughs> yes. it'd, be, it'd be at Pittsburgh. Yes. So. We got no love from the schedule yeah. makers. Yeah, but. but I'll tell you what, man, it was a heck of a run you had and I you know the memories we had man those uh those will never leave me well, I, I cherish them man yeah. and you were a big part of it all yeah, it was fun yeah
from 39 yards away. Snap is back. Ball is down. Dawson kick on the way, and the kick is up and good. Phil Dawson is the all-time field goal leader for the Browns. Kicking this close to Lake Erie had to be a nightmare. Yes. How did you tame this, this stadium? Well, I don't know if I ever tamed it, but I started to notice uh, early on that days that the wind came out of Southwest or the visitor tunnel were the worst days in here. We'd get a wind off the lake, the north side, it'd get knocked down, it was pretty manageable. We'd get a wind out of the east, which was rare, it'd hit the backside of the dog pound, just kind of dissipate. But something about that Southwest corner and the intensity in which it came through there, it would get magnified. Mm on the field. So I needed help gauging how hard is the wind coming in that southwest tunnel. Because the flags on the uprights wouldn't always tell the story. And so I went to our grounds crew guy, Chris Powell, and I said, I don't really know what I'm even asking for here. I just need some sort of flag in that southwest corner. Next home game, I'm pulling up, there's a pole and there's an upright flag on that pole. And uh, literally any kick I would have on the non-dog pound end, before I'd go out, I'd look at that flag to get an idea, the intensity, because the intensity, the intensity not all winds are created equal. Uh, if it was under 10, it wasn't gonna play much of a factor. If it was 10 to 20, it was gonna be horrible out there swirling, going the other way. If it was over 20, I was gonna pull a hamstring and not even try the kick. So. Uh, we, had, we also had uh, security personnel at the time who were former snipers from the Secret Service. And they taught me something about flags. And they said, if you look at the angle that a flag is blowing and you divide by four, that's the approximate wind speed. So if a flag is like at a 45 degree angle, that's gonna be an 11, 12 mile an hour wind. Wow. And so I literally could do these calculations, you know, going out on the field and know, okay, this is gonna be under 10, this is between 10 and 20, this is hamstring time, you know, whatever the case may be. And that, just putting that flag up is proof of how many people it takes to be successful because who would credit the grounds crew guy for any success I ever had other than a beautiful field he did? No, he put the flag up and guys like Dave Zastadil and I used it our entire careers here. So we kept this secret for a good while because we didn't want to give our tip away because you know Dave and I were real close and we used to joke how we'd meet the other kickers before the game and oh yeah how you doing good to see you we weren't about to help them one bit in fact we might even slide in there kind of rough day out here today trying to mess with them but it wasn't until one of our former coaches went elsewhere oh. and took news of the flag that other kickers started coming and so then there was a dilemma we had a we had a fellow NFL kicker who there should be a fraternity with, knew about the flag, would ask us about the flag, and we had to decide, are we gonna tell the truth and give away a competitive advantage and hurt him, you know, or are we gonna hurt him? Yeah. So it was kind of a running joke, and uh, I think that flag is pretty famous across the league now. So did you keep the secret, or did you? It eventually got out, Yeah. so after Cleveland, San Francisco, and Arizona. And you were in Arizona when Freddie was yes. a running backs coach there. So give us a good Freddie story about being a young running backs coach in the NFL. Man, I think the thing about Freddie, the guys love him. And, you know, he can be your coach. He can be your best friend. I mean, he just is who he is. And I think for today's NFL player, it's different than when I started. Today's NFL player, uh, they need someone who's just genuine, who's not about making big speeches or making a bunch of promises or a bunch of big picture thinking or communication. Just, here's what we're doing, here's what I expect out of you. Boom. But he does it in such a way that you like it. And I watched our running backs just take to that. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about that hire. Uh, I like Freddie personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's going to do a tremendous job. And I really think the, the team itself is going to respond to his style. And uh, you mix those together, it, it's going to be pretty good. Well, talk about the team and the talent that's here. You look at that defensive front four, 
and the running backs room and the wide receiver room and Baker emerging as one of the game's top young quarterbacks. What do you make of the 2019 Cleveland Browns? I mean, it's a, it's a star-studded roster. Uh, the thing that I think is going to put them over the top is they got a quarterback. Yeah, they do. You can look around the league. There's a lot of teams with talent. If you don't have a quarterback, it's all she wrote. So they've got talent at the most important position. And I'm a Baker fan, uh, even though he doesn't like Sam Ellinger. <laughs> uh, There's a history there. For him to walk on at two major universities and beat out scholarship uh, quarterbacks is impressive. I think that uh, coaches tend to be married to those guys. Absolutely. I mean, people's jobs are on the line. Sure. Why? Why the guy we gave a scholarship to? Why isn't he out there playing? Who's this kid that beat them all out? He did it twice. And uh, does that speak more, Phil? Do you think to his talent level or what's in the heart? Both. But I think what people in Cleveland are going to be drawn to is his heart, his passion, his intensity. Uh, they don't want to, you know. Rico Suave, Southern California, good-looking <laughs> arm talent guy. They want a blue-collar, tough competitor, get the job done. And if it's a little bumpy along the way, we love that even more. And I think that's, that's Baker. So you, you give him the receivers he has, the running game he has, a defense that you're not going to have to score a lot to, to win. Good grief. I mean, I think it's looking pretty good. He does seem straight out of central casting for Cleveland's perfect quarterback. Yeah. And it seems that Freddie is central casting for Cleveland's perfect coach. And it also seems like John Dorsey is central casting for Cleveland's perfect general manager. Yep. Is this the perfect storm? I hope it is. I, I mean, I really do. I, it's good for me to see the Browns and the city aligning themselves with to your point, the, you know, when we brought the West Coast offense in here, West Coast offense is, is incredible. A lot of, a lot of places have used it and, you know, it reinvented offensive football. I never felt like it matched here. And so now to have the general manager, the head coach, the most important player on the field, all representing Cleveland the way they do, just in their aura, whew. It's going to be special. It really feels like something special is, is coming on the horizon for sure. When you look back, Phil, I can't imagine that you would have many regrets because things worked out so well. But do you have anything now that you would have done differently in your, in your entire career? I don't know if, uh, if I would have done necessarily anything differently. I certainly made mistakes. I'm not trying to say I was perfect. Uh, you know, I wished, I have no regrets. I wished I would have been able to finish here. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have been able to carry that Lombardi trophy down Euclid Avenue. But that just wasn't in the cards. So now it's my turn to support the team, to cheer for the team. And when that Lombardi trophy comes down Euclid Avenue, I'll be hanging out there with you and we'll be celebrating together. You just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine a better I, place on the planet? I, I really can't, um, being a lifelong Cleveland sports fan. At the Cavs parade, I remember thinking, is this a dream or is this reality? But at the same moment, I couldn't help but think, what if this wasn't the Larry O'Brien trophy, mm -hmm. but this was the Lombardi trophy? Yeah, it's, it's unfathomable what it'll be like, especially given the history. How do you want Cleveland Browns fans to remember you? An adopted son, not from here. Didn't know a whole lot about it when I got here. Uh, but I came to love this place, and I tried to represent them through thick and thin. That's it. It's a pretty good way to be remembered. Phil Dawson, thank you so much for joining us on Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. Real pleasure. Thanks a lot. Enjoy your retirement. I have a feeling it's not going to be a full relaxation mode for you. You seem like a guy that's in motion and ready to go. We'll see. Good luck to you, Phil. Thank you very I'm much. I'm sure you'll find as much success on the other side.
Thank you for joining us for another edition of Club 46. Make sure you join us next week for our latest installment with another all-time great Cleveland Brown.